Meet Marie, top of her class, future valedictorian, and at this very moment, the most stressed out person on the planet. Why? Because it's 11.59 PM, and in less than 60 seconds, the portal to register for her final exams closes, forever. If she can't get past this masterpiece of 90s web design, she doesn't just fail an exam, she fails the entire semester. But Marie has a huge problem. She's forgotten the one sacred incantation to get in, her password. She tries everything, her cat's name, denied, her own birthday, access denied. The actual word password, don't be silly, access denied, her last hope, the forgot password button, a click of pure desperation. And it's broken. Of course, it's broken. The IT admin who is supposed to maintain this thing is currently sipping a mojito in the Bahamas, blissfully unaware of Marie's impending doom. Marie is panicking. She thinks her entire academic career is about to be vaporized by a login form from the Stone Age. She thinks she needs a miracle, but she is wrong. She doesn't need a password. She doesn't need a miracle. She doesn't even need to be a super hacker in a dark hoodie. All she needs is one single key, the apostrophe. Welcome to the world of SQL injection, the vulnerability that has been breaking the internet since the days of dial-up and is almost certainly running on your local pizza shop's website right now. To understand how Marie is about to completely dismantle her university's security, we need to talk about A. Butler. Imagine a robot butler. He is incredibly obedient, fast and precise, but he is also dumb as a rock. His entire existence revolves around taking orders from you and passing them to the big, scary database guard. Normally, the conversation goes like this. You say, robot, my name is Marie. The robot turns to the guard and says, check if the user is named Marie. The guard checks his list. If Marie is there, the door opens. Simple, right? But what happens if Marie decides to get creative? What if she doesn't just give her name? What if she gives an order disguised as a name? Instead of Marie, she types this, Marie or one one. Now, a human would say, that's not a name, that's nonsense. But the robot? The robot is an idiot. He doesn't check for nonsense. He just blindly repeats exactly what he was told. He turns to the guard and says, check if the user is named Marie, or if one equals one. The guard pauses. He looks at his list. Maybe Marie isn't there. But then he checks the second part. Does one equal one? Well, yes, one always equals one. It's a universal truth. The condition is true. So the guard steps aside and opens the door. Not because he found a password, not because he verified an identity, but because he was tricked by a simple logic puzzle that a toddler could solve. The logic itself was broken. Let's see this in action. Here is the university login page, staring us down. Behind the scenes, the code running this nightmare looks something like this. It looks innocent, right? Select user from users, where username equals whatever you typed. The website takes whatever we type and pastes it directly into that command. It's trusting us. That is a catastrophic mistake. Watch closely. In the username field, I am not going to type Marie. I am not even going to try to guess a valid username. I am going to type this specific lethal payload. Why? Let's break it down. The single quote acts like a scalpel. It closes the data field. It tells the database, end of the username string right here. Then the OR11 kicks in. This is our logical battering ram. We are asking the database, is the username blank or is one equal to one? Since one is always equal to one, the answer is always yes. But wait, what about the password check? That's still there, right? That's where the dash dash comes in. It's the assassin. In SQL, this symbol means start a comment. It tells the database, ignore everything that comes after this. Everything. The password check. It doesn't exist anymore. It's just a scribble in the margin. So the query becomes, give me the user where the username is empty or one equals one and ignore the rest. Let's hit enter. And et voila, she's in. 
Marie has just bypassed the entire security system with a sentence fragment. Okay, Marie is in. She registered for her exams. The crisis is over. She could just close the laptop and go to sleep like a normal human being. But she doesn't. Because Marie is curious. She looks at this shiny new admin interface she was never supposed to see, and a dangerous thought appears in her brain. If I can pretend to be an admin, what else can I see? She spots a simple search box at the top of the page that says, search student. This looks harmless, like something a secretary would use to check grades. Marie types Toto into the box and hits enter. Instantly, the page refreshes and cheerfully prints. Toto, grade F, brutal. Now Marie realizes something important. This search box is just another way of talking to the database through the same dumb robot butler. Before, the robot was asking, is this user allowed to log in? Now, the robot is asking, show me every student whose name contains the letters she typed. Same robot, same guard at the door, just a different kind of question. And this is where real hackers get excited, because bypassing the login is cool, but the real treasure isn't the door, it's what's behind it. Data, lots and lots of data. Exam answers, personal information, emails. And yes, probably a table literally called users, with usernames and passwords sitting inside like a buffet. To steal that data, Marie needs a new trick, the union attack. Think of union as duct tape for lists. The website is designed to show one list, a list of students that match the search. But with union, Marie can say, great, show that list, and then glue another list of my choice right under it. Normally, the hidden SQL query behind this search box looks roughly like select ID, name, grade from students, where name like Toto. The page takes whatever Marie types, stuffs it into that query, sends it to the database, and prints whatever comes back in a nice, innocent table. The key is that the table doesn't really care where the data came from. It just happily displays any rows and columns the database returns, as long as the shape matches. So here's the evil idea. Keep the first part that searches for students, and then bolt on a second part that says, oh, and also give me usernames and passwords from the users table. One page, two lists, one giant leak. Behind the scenes, Union has one strict rule. The two queries you glue together have to have the same number of columns in the same order of types. So an attacker will often first probe the site with harmless Union payloads using nulls or test strings just to figure out how many columns there are and which ones get displayed on screen. Once that is known, they can start swapping in real, sensitive columns like username and password into the visible positions. Back to Marie. She has already figured out how many columns this search page expects and which ones show up in the results. So now she's ready to go from student search to full-on database heist. In the search box where she just typed Toto, she now enters a very special payload. Something like apostrophe space union select one, username, password from users, dash dash. Read in plain English, she's telling the database. Stop taking my input as just a name and instead treat the rest as a second query that fetches usernames and passwords. The apostrophe at the beginning closes the original search string, just like before. It says, okay, that's the end of the student name. Now let's move on to something else. Then comes union select, which says, by the way, glue the results of this new query to the old one. The one is just a filler value to match the columns the page expects. The real stars here are username, and password from the users table. Finally, the double dash at the end starts a comment, which tells the database, ignore everything that the original developer wrote after this point. Any remaining conditions, filters, or safety checks that might have followed the search are silently turned into a comment and thrown in the trash. Marie hits enter, the page refreshes. At the top of the results, everything still looks normal. Toto, grade F, just a sad student and a bad grade. But then, right underneath, the interface starts to show rows that absolutely should not be there. Instead of more students, lines like this appear. Admin, super secret password. Then another, Professor Snape, I love potions 23. And then more, 
Usernames and passwords, one after another, all neatly formatted as if they were totally legitimate search results. What just happened? Marie didn't hack the page from the outside. She tricked the database into willingly handing over its secrets and packaging them nicely in the existing interface. The web application thinks it's just doing its job, showing a list of results from a query, but the query has been hijacked to pull from a completely different table. This is the power of a union-based SQL injection, using the site's own display logic as a delivery system for stolen data. No fancy malware, no backdoors, just one vulnerable input field and a carefully crafted sentence in SQL. And yes, Professor Snape really, really needs to choose a better password. So, how do we stop Marie? How do we slam this door shut? Do we ban the apostrophe from all user input? Nope. Because, what about everyone with a last name like O'Connor or D'Angelo? You can't just delete punctuation from existence. Blacklists and fancy regex patterns are a game you can never win. The real solution is simple, elegant, and used by every professional developer on the planet. Prepared statements. Here's the core problem. When we write vulnerable code, we take Marie's input and paste it directly into the SQL command as if it were part of the code itself. The database can't tell the difference between this is code I wrote and this is a string someone just typed. So when Marie injects an apostrophe or a union clause, the database sees it as a new instruction and blindly obeys. Prepared statements completely flip that logic. Instead of mixing code and data together into one messy blob, we separate them. First, we send the structure of the SQL command to the database, like a template with empty slots. We say, here is the query you're going to run. It has placeholders where data will go, but the structure itself is locked in stone. Then, separately, we send the actual user input as pure data. The database knows that this second part is not code. It's just text. It's just a string. So now, when Marie types something like admin or one, one, dash, dash, into the username field, the database doesn't see it as a clever logic puzzle to solve. It sees it as a literal weird username string. It treats it the same way it would treat Bob or Alice. Just characters, no special meaning, no power, Marie stays locked out, and the database stays safe. And just like that, Marie is safe. She didn't need a ski mask. She didn't need to rappel down an elevator shaft and she didn't need to build a supercomputer in her basement. She just needed a punctuation mark. It sounds ridiculous, right? Almost funny. But here is the part that isn't funny at all. SQL injection is a trick that has been documented for over 25 years. It's old enough to rent a car, and yet, in 2025, it is still devastatingly effective. Recent data from this year shows that SQL injection still accounts for nearly 7% of all vulnerabilities found in open source software. And if you look at the corporate world closed source projects, the stuff that banks and hospitals run on, it's even worse. Some reports show that over 10% of these projects contain SQL injection flaws. In fact, when companies first scan their code for security holes, a staggering 20% of them are found to be vulnerable to the exact same trick Marie just used. Why? Why is this still happening? Because developers are human and humans are wired to trust other humans. We want to believe that people will type their names, not database commands. We want to believe that the input is safe. But in the world of security, trust is a weakness. Trust is a bug. Never trust the user input, not even if the user is Marie. Especially not if the user is Marie. If this deep dive made you just a little bit more paranoid about your own code, or about your university's student portal, then my job here is done go ahead and smash that subscribe button. It tells the algorithm that you have excellent taste in paranoia. Until then, secure your inputs, trust no one, and happy hacking.